Hi everyone, my name is Anne-Marie Wills. I'm a neurologist here at Mass General in Boston, um, and I direct the Cure PSP Center of Care here. Um, I'm going to talk about recent uh, discoveries in PSP, and uh, I hope that this is going to be um, interesting. Um, I do have some disclosures. Um, I uh, participate in a lot of clinical trials, um, including um, the uh, recent uh, Biogen um, anti-tau uh, uh, antibody trial. Um, and um, now uh, we are uh, also participating in the transposon uh, therapeutics trial that's upcoming. Um, So, so this is my outline for today. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, PSP pathology to start, um, recent and newer diagnostic tools, biomarkers, um, therapies that are in development. And then I was going to walk people through how to find clinical trials and clinical research um, in their area um, if uh, people want to participate. So this is just a, a review of PSP pathology. I thought I would start with this just to, to sort of lay a groundwork um, because it's going to be useful um, as we go into the, the talk a little bit to, to, to have this background. Um, so, so people on this call have probably already seen um, the hummingbird sign, the Mickey Mouse sign talked about in the literature. This is in, in MRIs. Um, this is, this is a, a way of, of looking at the brain on the MRI and looking for areas um, that are involved in PSP. Classically, PSP starts in the midbrain. So here, literally the middle of the brain, right in the center, right here where my, like, my laser is. Um, and, and this is the area of the brain that controls eye movements. So that's one reason why eye movements are frequently an early sign of PSP. Um, and then it actually spreads throughout the, the brain stem and then later through the cortex, the part in orange here. Um, and so that gives you an idea of the disease progression. And also it gives us hints as to how the disease is worsening or how it is, how it is spreading through the brain, um, and that is, has given us ideas in terms of how we might tackle the disease or try to prevent it from, from getting worse. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to some of those ideas um, later. Um, this is the, the PSP pathology at the microscopic level. So if you, take a, if you take a slice through the brain and you look at the neurons under the microscope here on the right, you can see that the, the neuron, this is called a, a neurofibrillary tangle, the one the picture in the middle, you can see there's a neuron that's been filled with tau protein. And then on the right, you actually have an astrocyte. So astrocytes kind of support neurons and that has also been filled with tau. This is, this is sort of the, the classic pathologic appearance of PSP, um, these tangles and these tufted astrocytes. On the left, by comparison, is a picture of an Alzheimer's neuron, which is also filled with tau, but it looks different. The, 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 the distribution is different, as you can see. So, what is tau? What is the tau protein? Well, we know that is really important, sort of a structural supportive protein. So, so, uh, so neurons, as you know, they're really long. They have these really long axons, like the neurons that are in the, the leg, those can be a meter long, right? So, so you have, you have a really thin tube that's carrying the impulses and proteins and even RNA from the cell body all the way down to the synapse with, with either another neuron or, or with a muscle. Um, and that requires a structure, a skeletal backbone. And that structure is produced by these microtubules. So the tau protein is part of 
these microtubules, it's, it supports them. And if it is abnormal, like in PSP, then those microtubules start to fall apart here. So this is just a, a picture of, of them sort of un, unwinding and falling apart. Tau is encoded by the MAPT gene, and rarely we do see mutations in MAPT that can lead to PSP. So that's a, another supportive hint as to the importance of this gene and this protein in PSP. One really exciting thing that was just published, um, this is from uh, Michelle Goodart and um, uh, Shares Group um, in England. They used a new, this is, this is called cryo-electron microscopy. And this is, so this is, this is at the molecular level. So this is well below the, the level of the cells. Now we're looking at individual molecules. And they do this, this is amazing. This, this, this technology actually got the, the Nobel Prize in, in 2017. And they, they're able to look, they're able to, to basically freeze the protein and then put it through this scanning electron microscope which bounces electrons off of it. And then they can reconstruct like a three-dimensional shape of the protein and then figure out what it, what it actually looks like. Um, so here they were able to do this with all the different types of tau protein related diseases. So you may have heard of this three repeat tau, four repeat tau. What they were able to find was in fact, of the different types of tau proteins, so there are different, there's slight differences in tau that are between all of these diseases. And they were actually able to show using this, this, um, this cryo-electron microscopy, they were actually able to show that there's a difference in the way that tau is folded between all of these diseases. So you can actually differentiate them at a molecular level using this. So that was, that was just an amazing um, just tour de force. That was incredible. Um, so the, the, the question of course is, well, how, do, how can we use this for, for, for treatment, for diagnosis? Um, one thing that is uh, going on right now is trying to image tau in living people. And there are special dyes that you can inject and then you can get a, they bind to the towel and then, it, and then it shows up on a special PET scan. There's one that's, that's actually FDA approved called Talvid. It's, it's, it's a little, it's, it's more useful in Alzheimer's than in PSP um, because it, it has this issue where it, 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 it does bind to towel, but it doesn't really differentiate between the different types of towel that we just talked about. And it also has this problem of sort of non-specific binding in these deeper, these deeper sort of subcortical regions, like the midbrain um, that we were just talking about. And here, I'm just going to blow this up so you can see. So on the left, here's a control subject, and here's the P, here are the PSP subjects. So, so this midbrain that we were really interested in, see how this kind of looks like the Mickey Mouse sign. So this midbrain, as you can see, it lights up in the control subject as well. So this is kind of one of the one of the main limitations of this Talbid. So it hasn't really been adopted at this point um, for diagnosis in PSP. However, there are new ligands, new dyes that seem to be more specific for the type of folding that is happening in PSP. And for example, we're gonna, we're gonna look at this PI2620. Um, there is a, a nice paper um, out of Germany that, um, that uh, stated that there was, that there, this was, this particular ligand, this particular dye was be better able to distinguish PSP from Alzheimer's down here, the really brightly lit up one from Parkinson's here in the middle. And you can see the top two are PSP. You can see that they do, they do visually look different. 
um, than the PD and the AD. Um, there's a group here, um, which is, this is a, a clinical trial, which is um, spearheaded by Adam Boxer at UCSF called Fortney which is trying to replicate this data um, using also the, 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 same, the same PET scan. Um, and they also are doing additional tests, so MRIs, um, special biomarkers and blood and, and possibly spinal fluid. Um, and this is a really, um, this is a really valuable uh, longitudinal study. So this is a study where they're looking at people over time to try to see how all of these scans, these special scans, and then these special blood tests are gonna behave over time to see if it might be useful as an, as an outcome measure, as something that you could measure to see if there's, if drugs are having an impact on the disease. Um, and I'm putting in here the contact information for the research coordinator at UCSF, if anyone is interested in participating. There are sites elsewhere in the country. Um, um, so, so if, um, but if you, if you want to, to reach out to them and just find out if there's a way for you to participate, um, I would encourage people to do that. Um, this, is, this, is, this is a really interesting and new idea. Um, there's something called real-time quaking-induced conversion, rt quick which is basically a way of looking for proteins that are misfolded in blood and in spinal fluid in people who are alive as a diagnostic tool. So again, we're trying to differentiate between different types of tau protein misfolding, also trying to differentiate it from the, the Parkinson's um, protein and the Alzheimer's protein, which are different proteins. And this is, this is a really interesting tool that looks like it's really sensitive to different types of tau. So, so what you do is, so it's sort of like, I don't know if you ever did that experiment where you, where you, you, you um, dissolve sugar in water at like really, really high concentration, and then you put in a little sugar cube and it forms crystals like rock candy. It's a lot like that. So the idea is you start with a whole bunch of tau protein that's, that's made in the lab, and then you take some spinal fluid typically and you from a, a person who has presumably PSP, and you drop it in, and then it actually seeds the tau and makes it fold and, and, and sort of it, it causes a cascade of misfolding. And this would be specific to different types of tau, we think. This is, this is, this is all, this is very much in work in progress. Um, it, this definitely has to be uh, replicated, but this is a, a, an exciting um, new uh, type of, of uh, diagnosis, diagnostic tool, we think. Um, and here's an example where the, the RT Quick seems to have differentiated PSP from CBD from the, the cortical basal syndrome, um, and then also from healthy controls and, and, and uh, Alzheimer's. Um, and this is and this is um, again, this is using that that special seeding technique. So um, I'm going to take a little uh, break here, and we're going to segue into um, possible therapies in development. Um, I want to encourage people to put their questions into the chat box um, so that I can address them in, in, in uh, real time. Um, so, okay, so we've been talking about tau and the importance of tau misfolding. Um, we're going to talk here about different techniques that people have been trying to try to address tau or try to prevent some of that pathology from happening. So on the far left, antisense oligonucleotides. You may have heard about this because of, for example, there was a really um, impressive um, outcome from uh, SMA um, 
And uh, this is this is basically where you inject a, 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 a drug into the spinal fluid that then binds to the RNA that's being produced, degrades it, and prevents the protein from ever being expressed. So it it, it this sort of antisense um, therapy is being tried in a whole bunch of genetic diseases right now. It definitely knocks it down. The challenge has been, um, other than the SMA uh, example, the challenge has been whether the knockdown of the protein is going to be adequate to prevent the, the disease. Um, but that's something that is um, being worked on right now, primarily actually in Alzheimer's. Um, these, these two drugs are, are being tested um, in uh, early stages um, in humans, but but we're hopeful that this is going to be um, tried in PSP next. Um, there are um, modifications of tau after it's made. So after after it's produced, um, there there are different um, attachments uh, that are that are uh, that. For example, this is this is one uh, called oglycanase um, that. Um, uh, stabilizes the, the the tau protein, and um, the there is a drug that um, Asineuron uh, is testing um, in Australia right now, um, not in PSP again. Again, it's in um, Alzheimer's, but they they have expressed interest in PSP. Um, microtubule stabilizers. So we were talking about how tau is important for that structure of the of the neuron. So microtubule stabilizers have included divunatide, which was tested a couple of years ago. Um, unfortunately, it was not effective. And then BMS also has a drug, um, which um, I don't think is um, in human trials. Um, and then uh, there have been the the antibodies against tau. Um, so so Biogen and AbbVie um, did their large uh, clinical trials, um, which you know unfortunately were ineffective. But the idea was they were they had antibodies that would um, bind to the tau outside of the cell. So they, it wasn't getting into the cells, but the hypothesis was okay. If we know that tau is spreading through the brain, it must be spreading between the neurons. And then if you could attack it with an antibody before it gets to the next neuron, maybe it would prevent it from spreading. So that was a hypothesis. Um, unfortunately, those, those trials were not effective. Um, UCB has another type of antibody. It's actually um, attacking a different part of the tau protein and the hope is that that might be a little bit more specific for PSP. Um, they uh, hopefully are going to um, still move forward in, in PSP in the future. Um, they are working in, in Alzheimer's. Um, and then there is a, a, actually a, an, a vaccine against tau that is also an early stage development. So, um, so those are those are the the trials um, that are attacking tau. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about trials that are currently ongoing, um, and in which people can uh, participate next. Um, so, uh, transposon therapeutics, and full disclosure, we are a site for the transposon trial. Um, transposon is looking at these interesting. They're called line one. There are these interesting parts of your DNA. Everybody has portions of our DNA that are being suppressed, and they're probably being suppressed for a good reason. And tau, when it when there's misfolded tau, it appears to allow those dormant portions to be expressed again. And we don't know exactly what those those portions of the of the genome are doing. But it seems that it has been identified to be to be um, expressed in both Alzheimer's and PSP. And so the, the hypothesis that transposon wants to test is whether re-repressing these abnormal elements 
might actually help with PSP. So there is a, an early um, uh, phase two study um, that is um, starting up now, um, which is a, basically just a six month uh, double blind uh, study followed by an open label trial, um, which is going to be looking at um, the, the just a, a sort of more of a, a multiple ascending dose um, kind of a trial looking looking at the safety, tolerability, and, and, and the uh, efficacy in terms of knocking down um, these line one uh, elements. Um, so um, that is that is one uh, clinical trial that is ongoing. Um, Retrotope, um, I know people were very excited about when they when they heard about it. They this this company actually is running their um, trial in Germany right now. Um, this is this is a special deuterated form of linoleic acid. So one of the, the, the fatty acids that um, is, is in the membrane of the cells, this, this way of modifying it prevents it from becoming damaged by oxidative stress. So um, they, the, the retrotope people um, have, um, they, they are doing a study in Europe right now um, they say that they think that they'll have um, a, a result for us in, in about one year, and then they will decide if they want to expand um, internationally, um, including in the U.S. Um, this is a clinical trial that um, I've actually initiated um, uh, here at Mass General um, and uh, with the help of, of my colleague, uh, uh, Alex Pantelliet at uh, Hopkins and also um, working with a, uh, a sensor device company called Biosensix. Um, we've created a way of measuring um, PSP gait in the people's homes. Um, and, so, and so the idea would be this is basically we're already doing this where we send a kit to people's homes you put it on, you wear it, you do a couple activities, walking activities some cognitive activities on a tablet. And then we're able to sort of measure the disease from the comfort of your home without you actually having to come in to the hospital. And the goal would be to make this an outcome measure that we could use for clinical trials to reduce the burden of having to come in to medical centers to be, to be tested frequently. Um, so I'm kind of excited about this because we have a little bit of preliminary data, which you can see here. Person on the left is quite early in the course of their disease. The person on the right is, is more advanced. And you can see just visually, you can see how different their gait is. This is the timed up and go test where you can see each step here. When they turn around, and they walk back. And over here on the right, you can see how small and, and, and irregular the, the steps are. So I'm, I'm kind of excited that this is going to be in the future a better way of um, measuring PSP and an easier and, and more comfortable way of measuring PSP. Um, and here are my inclusion criteria. We are able to enroll people remotely. So um, if you are... Uh, if you have a diagnosis of uh, possible or probable PSP, and if you're still able to walk 10 feet without any assistive devices, um, so no walker, for example, then we would love to um, enroll you. Um, Monsi, uh, my research coordinator, her email is below here um, and her phone number, um, and uh, we'd be happy to, to, to talk to you uh, about the study. Um, so in general, how can you find clinical trials near you? So what I recommend is going to the clinicaltrials.gov website. This is, um, this is run by the government. Every clinical study has to be registered in this website. So you can search for PSP under condition or disease, then filter by recruiting. I have also not yet recruiting here. Then also filter by the map location. So see here on the on the tab, you can you can you can look at it on a map, and this is what you're going to see. Here is 
the worldwide distribution of PSP clinical trials. Um, and you can zoom in on the US and then zoom in on your state where you live and you can try to find um, any, any trials that are near you this way. Um, and um, so I would encourage people to, if they're interested in, in, in research, if I would encourage people to try to sign up um, for clinical trials. Um, this is just my personal wish list um, for um, clinical trials. Um, obviously, we need better and earlier diagnostic tools. Uh, we need to work on the imaging and biomarkers, um, especially the longitudinal um, results in terms of these, uh, whether these can be used to, to measure disease progression. Um, I'd like to see better PSP animal models. And then, of course, we're working on improved outcome measures. Um, and the eventual goal is to find therapies that are going to slow down PSP. So I'd like to thank my collaborators um, and uh, also the, the Dolce's for uh, funding the wearables study. Um, and I'm going to take your questions. But this is also, um, you can also, if you, if you don't want to, um, if you think of something later, you can also send an email to uh, info at curepsp.org. Um, don't uh, forget to go to the clinicaltrials.gov website. Um, and these are two um, uh, studies that I mentioned uh, that are uh, enrolling people um, nationwide. Um, so I would encourage people to, to reach out to these coordinators. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi, Dr. Wills. How are you doing today? Good. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for presenting us with such a thorough um, look into our research updates for our community. Um, at this time, we'd like to take questions from the audience. And we're going to start with a few that we captured during the registration process. But of course, for all of you that are tuned in with us here today, now is the time to pose those questions in the chat and we'll uh, get to as many as we possibly can. Um, so let's waste no more time and jump right in here. So you really covered a lot of important information and our very first question was, uh, how do we find clinical trials? And luckily you just covered that in the very end of your presentation. So. Um, just to recap that, that would be clinicaltrials.gov, and you can also get there from going to the Cure PSP website, of course. Um, right. And I, I did one. actually, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to, to mention one, one trial, and I, I hope my sound, is my sound quality okay? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, um, so I forgot to mention one clinical trial, um, which is actually sponsored by the Parkinson's Foundation. It's called Topaz. It's the trial of Parkinson's and zoledronic acid, but they are actually enrolling non-Parkinson's. So, so PSP and MSA are also invited to join. Um, and, and what that trial is doing is it is testing whether a once year, actually a one-time infusion of uh, something called zoledronic acid, which is like a really strong osteoporosis drug, will prevent fractures um, when people have falls and maybe even improve survival. Um, so as you can imagine, um, when you have PSP, you're at increased risk of falling. So even, so, so this, this study is testing whether um, even if you don't have true osteoporosis, there might actually be a benefit to treating your bone strength, um, and even before you know you have like a clear indication for needing these these drugs, so so that's an interesting study because it's another one where you can sign up remotely. You you go onto their website, and we're going to put the the link um, to the website um, on the at the bottom of the event page. But it's basically just topazstudy.org. Um, and you can you can sign up and then um, they will actually enroll you and everything virtually online. 
and then they will send a nurse to your house and and they will do the infusion um, at home for you. So you don't have to leave your home or, or, or travel to a center or anything like that. And, and so that's, again, trying to like increase people's access to clinical trials um, and, and making it easier for, for, for people to do things um, remotely. So, so that's another thing that I, I, I apologize, I forgot to mention in the slides, um, but, but that's a really great study as well. Excellent. Thank you for pointing our attention towards that. Um, here's another question. Um, is there any research to lead uh, to look into whether or not the disease is, is environmentally related? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, as you can imagine, um, PSP is a rare enough disorder that you can't see you don't find cases in any of these really large prospective studies, like, you know, people have heard of the nurse's health study, for example. Um, there aren't any PSP patients, apparently, in the nurse's health study. And, and um, so it, it makes doing epidemiology research really, really hard um, in this disease. Um, Irene Litvin did a case control retrospective study. So this is one of those studies where people um, report in hindsight, like what they were, what, what type of job they had, and um, you try to extract what kind of exposures they might have had. Um, and, it, and it did seem like there was like a, an increased risk from smoking. Um, which interestingly is different than Parkinson's, where actually there's a reduced risk of, of Parkinson's for smokers. Um, but um, but there there weren't any clear, um, you know, job related uh, toxin exposure um, signals, you know, to 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 really give us a good idea of of what might be causing this or how 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 the environment might contribute to this so it's it, it's still that's still a tough um unsolved question yeah. thank you um moving on to the next question uh does having an abnormal dat scan mean the person has msa so is it how much of a diagnostic tool is it uh not only for msa but also for cbd and psp um an abnormal dat scan yeah, no, a DAT scan will be abnormal in most of our diseases. And by our diseases, I mean the diseases that cure PSP support. So PSP, CBS, MSA, um, and of course, Parkinson's will all have abnormal DAT scans. So, so it's not terribly helpful in terms of make, like differentiating between these. Um, there is actually a new um, thing that you can do. It's a skin biopsy. Um, which um, there's actually a commercial company now that can do this called CND. Um, and what you do is you take like tiny little biopsies, one of the neck, two of the leg, and then you stain for synuclein um, in, the, in the skin. And amazingly, you will find synuclein inclusions in the nerves of the skin in Parkinson's, MSA especially. In fact, MSA has even like more impressive staining than, than, than Parkinson's. Um, uh, some other synuclein um, diseases, uh, primary autonomic failure, things like that. But um, so, so that could potentially help to differentiate um, a synuclein disease from a tau disease. Um, it hasn't really been proven yet. Like people haven't, I mean, the, the company's actually doing a large um, prospective study to see if they, the, the, that it, if it can help in that clinical way. But, um, but that, that might actually be a little bit more useful, I would say, um, for this question than the DAT scan. That's extremely helpful. Thank you for such a, a clear explanation of of just exactly how the skin biopsy studies are working. Um, let's see. Let's, uh, I'll ask this question. Are there any meds or treatments to slow disease progression in PSP, MSA, or CBD or deal with symptoms? 
Uh, symptoms, yes. Um, we, we, this is sort of where the research is, is going, is trying to find a disease, a, a disease modifying, um, disease slowing treatment. Um, and, and to date, we don't have anything. It's, 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 um, so, but that's, that's, that's again, where, where research comes in and we're, you know, trying to, trying to come up with, with clinical trials that will be helpful. Um, under symptom management, there, there's actually quite a lot of things that you can do. And, and there was a very nice review article, um, that, um, everybody actually, all the Cure PSP um, physicians contributed to um, that uh, Dr. Golby uh, really spearheaded, which was published in Frontiers of Neurology um, a couple months ago. Um, but basically, so it talks about um, by sort of system, it talks about symptoms and then what, what sort of treatment options there are. So obviously, Cinemet is um, something that you know most people try. Um, people may or may not try amantadine. Um, some of the antidepressants can be very helpful. Um, the, there are treatments for constipation, excessive saliva, urinary dysfunction. Um, and, 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 and one thing that I will um, put, a, a, I think it is important to talk to a neurologist who has some uh, knowledge of PSP or some, some idea because you don't want, for example, to get an anticholinergic medication for bladder dysfunction that will make thinking and falls worse. So, so I do think that that's, you know, one of, one of the, one of the important things that, that, that we can contribute. Um, and, um, that, that article is, 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 um, publicly available, freely available. And so I think anybody who, um, you know, wants to, to, to read more details about, about treatment can, can go there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, we've got time for one more question. Unfortunately today we did have a couple we weren't able to get to, but, um, I also want to make mention of the fact that we do have the ask the doctor series that's on our cure PSP TV, YouTube channel, which also talks a lot about symptom management and, um, was just a, a forum for answering our, the questions from our community through 2020 and early 2021. Um, the last question, we talked a lot about clinical trials. You talked a lot about clinical trials in your presentation. Um, but the last question we have today is, are all of the trials for early diagnosis only? Hmm, that's tough. Um, the intervention trials tend to be on the earlier side of things. Um, uh, the, the imaging studies, um, for example, the Fortney imaging study, um, uh, I believe does not have a cutoff in terms of um, disease duration or severity. Um, uh, uh, Topaz similarly does not have a cutoff. Um, they do require you to be able to consent. So able to, you know, understand and, and the process and, and give consent. Um, so those, those might be helpful. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that's all the time we've got for today. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Wills, once again, for your time and for being a part of today's conference and also a part of you know, a group of the leading minds that are making such a difference for those affected by these diagnoses um, and all of your coworkers as well. Um, the final presentation today will be from Jessica Shore, our new director of patient and care partner advocacy and she'll be closing out the conference. So thank you once again, Dr. Wills, and we'll certainly see you again soon. And Jessica, welcome back.